Now try not to kick it, tackle it, or you know, take a sledgehammer to it. Okay, I know you'll feel like it. <laughs> We got, uh, we, got a we, we, got, uh, we still got a few seats open. Uh, middle, all the aisle and uh, window seats have been taken. Uh, sorry, the exit rows are completely full. Um, but uh, for those of you who are standing in the back, welcome. Um, and uh, we'll get started right on time because I got a lot of really cool things to share with you. Um, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming to this monthly meeting of Gameaholics Anonymous. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to our member. Hi, everyone. Um, this is my first time to Gameaholics Anonymous. I'm a little scared. And there's sure a lot of you, so gosh, I, I feel like. Uh, I've got uh, some really good breath in here. <laughs> um, so, my name is Nye, and yes, I am a gameaholic. I was two years sober, you know, not, have, not having to hit the sauce, the online world. But then something happened to <laughs> Pokemon, Pokemon, Pokemon Go. And lo and behold, that phenomenon happened in 2016. And it got me off my couch and into the real world. <laughs> it was scary. I met other people doing the same thing I was doing in parks, trains, in automobiles, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and even in sketchy parts of town, which you're not even supposed to be. So I'm a gameaholic, and I admit it. And for those of you who don't know who Pokemon Go is, where have you been? <laughs> but then, 2018 happened, and another horrible thing happened to our wonderful world of gaming. Fortnite phenomenon. Anybody here heard of Fortnite before? Okay. Anybody here not heard of Fortnite before? Okay. Well, you can get school pretty quick. All right, so I want to see, you know, we're among friends here. It's a safe space. Anyone else here, uh, Gameaholic, please raise your hand. Oh, cool, we got a few of you. Nice, nice to be in. I want to take a picture of this so, to show that there are fellow educators who are game -holics. So raise your hands again. All right, good. Let's see here. Good, good. Awesome. Oh, great. So, you know, for those of you who rose your hands, you understand the feeling, the itch in the back of your head, the drive to want to make one more move. People here. <laughs> and you know, the, the need to have to do one more task. So here I am, and this is my agenda here. Um, we're first going to be understanding the gamer. Then we're going to talk a little bit brief history of video games and how it's evolved over time. Then we're going to talk about video game addiction, which has now been officially made by the WoW people. Not World of Warcraft, but. <laughs> <laughs> World of Organization, how it affects us as educators, and also to teach you about the culture of gaming because they are a whole culture in itself. You know, you, you, know, you got cultures for everything. You got the sports people, you got the gods, you got the music, you got the drama, and you got the gamers. <laughs> and we are a very interesting lot. <laughs> and also, I'm going to give you an example of how we gamified a, a subject that. Most kids feel it, and by like gamifying it, we made them love it. So, mathematics. So, first off, this is going to be a full house. You know, so uh, please uh, raise your hand if you have a seat next to you. 
Um, no windows and aisle seats are available. This is Southwest, this is open seating, seating policy. Please take your seats uh, and fasten your seat belts for a wild ride. I love Southwest, by the way. <laughs> um, so we're gonna crank it up to 11. We're gonna take it to warp speed. Go Trek Keys. Um, we're gonna take it to ludicrous speed. <laughs> and we're gonna take a major brain dump because this session is gonna expose you to a whole new world and it's gonna open your eyes and you're gonna be slack job for the rest of the day. And I've even had people come up to me and say, I took 20 pages of what you said. I'm like, what did you do? Transcribe my every word I said? <laughs> So it is, a, it is a major brain dump. But fortunately for you, I'm actually recording this session as well. So, uh, so that will become available once I post it on the interwebs. <coughs> Warps, ludicrous speed. For anyone who don't, don't remember this night. Popular 1983. Spaceballs. OK, so a little bit about myself to set this context. So first off, I had some disadvantages growing up as a kid. You know, Y'all know that some of your kids have disadvantages too. Mine are pretty unique, but not un unheard of. First off, I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> yes, it is still funny. I was made in Taiwan. But then I was exported to the United States, um, or imported, sorry, into the United States, when I uh, right at the tender age of two. And then when my parents came over, they decided to do the ch Chinese thing, which is open up a Chinese restaurant. Um, so I grew up in a restaurant. And if you know anybody who are restaurant tours or family owned operated restaurants, it's a really uh, you know, a rough business to be in. Most restaurants fail. But fortunately, we did pretty well and we kept our doors open. I also had some problems as well. I was English as a second language. My pr primary language is Chinese. And I had, to, had some reading problems. I actually had to go to speech class for two years to get myself up to speed with the standards. And thank goodness those people did a really good job because I don't have a single lick of accent. <laughs> so the reading problems were really pervasive because of the fact that when I was reading a book, I could never retain the content. It was so difficult. It was just like staring at a blank page. Anybody have any kids that do that? Okay. I also had another problem, ADHD. Anybody have anybody you know with ADHD? Oh, wow. Has it been cured? I don't see it yet. <laughs> okay, rhetorical question. We know every single kid has that problem. <laughs> I even failed a math class. Yes, it's funny because look at me. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Okay? You know the stereotype, and it's mostly true. It's not because I wasn't good at math, it's because I wasn't engaged. I wasn't, I wasn't stimulated enough. And the teacher wasn't going at the speed I really needed it to go. So, because of these problems, with, especially with ADHD, my parents were so poor because we were, uh, we were uh, operating a restaurant. They didn't take me to a psychiatrist, put me on meds, and then I lived happily ever after. No, I had to deal with it uh, physically, not uh, chemically, and actually work with my problem and figure out how I can adapt in a world where people weren't ADHD. So because everyone would tell me, sit and focus, sit and focus. I can't do that, I can't do that. <laughs> so, so I had to work and figure that out for myself. So what happened is, I turned that disadvantage into a superpower. So because of that, I am able to do things that my peers growing up cannot, are not able to do. I have like heightened senses. I can look out in the world and I can notice and, uh, and, and recognize things that they can't. I mean, it's just like, it's like, like having this like radar going on all the time. Um, I have like multi-point perception. So like, you know, uh, it's like I see things going on and then really react to it. That actually is attributed to a lot of real-time strategy games that I played when I was younger, where you had a million things like troops and uh, things moving around and bullets flying all over the screen and you have to do something about it, otherwise you would die. Um, and and it was, those, those um, skills were perfect for video games. And by playing video games, I perfected that skill over, the, over time. <clears throat> so, then over, so then once I uh, grew up, um, I, program, uh, I taught myself to program, uh, and then I gamified uh, my, my very first subject, which is the culinary arts, because, well, I grew up in a restaurant, I had to do culinary arts. Um, <laughs> and then I uh, really just started my, my evolution into education from there. Um, so, we are living in, a, in an age of instant gratification. Okay, we're going to stick this 
in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. <laughs> and girls, everyone gets cake. Okay. <laughs> I love the big bang theory. Anybody like love the big bang theory? Anybody sad that it's finally over? <laughs> Pay a moment of silence for that. <laughs> Wonderful show. And in the meantime, we'll take a nice little selfie here. So selfie time. Here we go. Everyone smile big. Left side. Okay, there we go. Now right side, or left or right, okay, where is it? I'll post that up quicker later. So yeah, it, it really illustrates like the, the kids that are growing up today, because they've never known a world where they didn't have information in the fingertip. You know, back when we grew up, most of us, we had to go to this like card thing to look for a book. What is it called again? Card. Yeah. yeah, and it used a system called? Do we yes. Do we what the heck is that? And then, uh, you know, you're, let's say you're, you're at the university stacks and you're doing this wonderful research paper on some sort of like uh, um, scientific breakthrough in 1968, and you had to go into the, and you pick up this what thing called? Abstract. Oh, uh, yeah, I hear it very, I think. All right, and then you had to use this device called a microfish. <laughs> and it scanned all those articles. Yeah, so we had to work really hard to get our information. Now it's right in our fingertips. So, so we, you know, we are in that age where we don't have to work for information anymore. Now we have to work to curate that information. We have to work to disseminate that information and to take that information to the next level. <laughs> so, where did it all start? Um, with this. <laughs> Two weird lines and a dot moving across the screen. Wow, how archaic is that? Well. It was, it was phenomenal, because before that, us as humans never saw a digital medium being manipulated by humans before. Before it was like, you know, you had to move, manipulate a physical object to make a physical object do something. Now we see this, and we're like going, oh, there's this whole new world, a digital world, using computers and graphics and, and things like that to do things that we could never do before. So from that spawned a whole age of, of computer nerds. <laughs> And from them, you know, they started creating things called video games, like Pac-Man, you know, Donkey Kong, Super Mario Brothers. And it just kept going and changing and evolving to becoming more and more sophisticated until we got to where we are today, Pokemon Go. Now, Pokemon Go was a, was a game changer because, first off, it made video games super popular, not in the bad way like some of the other video games, but in a way that we actually got kids off their seats and out into the real world doing something. This game drove kids to walk, <laughs> to socialize, to actually to do things in the real world where before everything was in, in front of the TV or on your handheld. So, so in, the, in its uh, initial launch, it had 45 million users around the world download and play that game. And I was one of those 45 million. In fact, one person uh, tweeted when they first came out that he caught a Pidgey, which is one of the, uh, the bird-type Pokemon, uh, while her, his wife was in labor. <laughs> okay, I don't know if they're still together today. <laughs> but you can see that the level of set obsession that these adults and kids were, because this, this thing was ingrained in culture since the late 90s. And when the game came out, everybody had to play it. In fact, here I am at the uh, Inner Harbor with a little life scooter, and I was scooting around hitting Poke Stops uh, the other day because there's a lot of Poke Stops right here. <laughs> anyway, it, it's so crazy that things like this happen. People were racing because uh, Pokemon. Let <laughs> check. Pokemon here somewhere, and then they're all rushing to catch it. So, so it's, it's, it was such a phenomenon. I mean, and I, and I illustrate this because the next phenomenon happened, which was Fortnite, which, which brought another level of gameplay, which is called Battle Royale, where you had 100 people pitted against each other to find out who's going to be the last one standing. Um, 
nothing like that was ever done before. And that became a craze because kids had access to it on any device. They, didn't, they weren't stuck with an Xbox or a PC. They could use it on a phone. They could use it on their, their tablet. They could do everything with it. And it's fun. Not really, actually. I get killed all the time. <laughs> I, I haven't had a single win. Anybody had a win in solo? Solo? Wow! <laughs> that is dedication. <laughs> okay, so first off, I want to see if there's any gamers in here. But I'm going to start with the first level, arcade. Anybody here start with arcade gaming? Raise your hand. Okay, remember when you had to go to put a device and put a coin in? Uh, in a, usually at a smoky bar or something like that, pizza parlor. So that's when the, when the, when the first uh, uh, video game started. Then they went to console. So who was introduced when there was console? Okay, good. All right, next PC. So would these product productivity machines become became gamers. So not a whole lot of PC gamers. Okay. Uh, no one does World of Warcraft. Okay. Uh, portable gaming. So when the uh, handhelds came out, like Game Boy. Anybody here uh, were are portable handheld gamers like Tony? Okay, good. Now smartphone. Who here plays Candy Crush, Haiti, uh, Solitaire? I should see all of your hands up. You play some sort of game on your smartphone. So what smartphone does is it, it, it basically made gaming platforms ubiquitous. Every single phone is a gaming platform now. Before you had to spe have specialized devices, but now these things in our pockets are as powerful as most gaming consoles were five years ago. It is just utterly ridiculous. Okay, and anyway, you play solitaire. Okay, you're a gamer. <laughs> okay, so this is an explanation that came up with um, actually over a decade ago that really explains like how the entertainment industry uh, has shaped our, the minds of our kids. So over here on your on the left, my right, we have cartoon characters. So these iconic cartoon characters uh, were pretty much what uh, you guys grew up with, right? So when your parents were occupied and they wanted you to sit and pay attention, to, to sit and be quiet, still, stay still, they put you in front of the TV. And usually there's a cartoon going on and that, that kept you uh, uh, absorbed. So the, these characters that would tell stories, you would laugh with them, you would cry with them, and then you become enamored with them, you would become obsessed with Missy, Mickey Mouse, you go to Disneyland, we're in Mickey Mouse years, well now, uh, Star Wars Galaxy <coughs> Edge, which I can't wait to go to. So, so basically, you know, these, these characters get ingrained into your psyche, and you are sitting there in front of a TV being entertained by it. So, at that time, it would tell the around, the classroom was set up in nice neat rows, the teacher was sitting standing in front of you, lecturing at you, and as a kid, you were like going, hey, this makes sense. I, my parents put me in front of the TV, I'm looking at it, I'm listening to the, the TV tell me stuff, they're showing me things. This makes sense. Does compute. So there was no problem in that type of setup because kids were being trained that this is how I receive information. I have no way of talking back. All I can do is sit there and listen. But then when video games came out, it changed the world. Now instead of uh, those characters that you get uh, enamored with, we have these characters. Uh, Pikachu, Sonic, Link, and uh, Mario. So instead of sitting there watching these characters do what they're doing, now they have active control with the controller. They can make decisions. They can decide how they want to go through a level. They can decide how many times they want to go through a level. They can decide how well they can go through a level. And then they can make these decisions on, on the, the, and choose the destinies of these characters. And then they grow up, they go into the school, they sit in these nice neat rows, the teacher's up front lecturing at you, you're like, where's my control? I want to make some decisions. I want to do this thing over again. But oh, sorry. I'm lecturing at you, you have to pay attention, sorry, I'm only going to say it once, and if you don't get it, sorry, you're out. <laughs> Anybody had any lectures like that before? <laughs> so that did not work, does not compute. So when the video games started training our kids to take entertainment this way, that's when the disconnect happened in education. That's when we try to do things to mimic that with VHS players, DVD players, with smart boards, all those things did not work because ultimately those kids still did not have any control. So, this is the problem we have. Now, I'm going to tell you the solution. No, I'm sorry. There is no solution. Sorry. But there is a path to a solution. So, first off, we need to understand that video games is an addiction and all these kids are susceptible to it. Well, let's go back. You know, so, did that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Someday I'll write a paper about it. 
Okay, so let's pretend it's a widespread epidemic. 97% of youth on, in a survey from ages 2 through 17 said they have touched the stuff called video games. Well, 64 million kids in the USA, that represents 64 million kids. We're also finding that the ages, years 2 through 5, are the fastest growing segment. Now why is that? Well, with these touch devices, two-year-olds don't have to manipulate a control or a keyboard or a joystick or anything like that. They can just touch what they want. They can swipe what they want. They can Snapchat at two years old. <laughs> I don't know. But it's amazing what these kids can do. But it's actually not amazing. We have programmed it. AIM China has an internet boot camp uh, where they send kids for a month who are addicted to video games and they completely separate them from society and get them back in and away from the game. Because the kids have died playing these video games. Just do a Google search. You'll find so many articles of kids dying, mostly in China and other countries, because it's bad. In fact, you know, the World Health Organization, who, not Dr. Who, um, in 2018, actually listed it as an official um, disease. And uh, just last night, it was funny, I was watching the news and they were talking, doing a news segment on Gamer Thumb, where basically there's an actual therapy for people who play too many video games, so you actually have to go through physical therapy to fix your Gamer Thumb. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? So why is it so addicting? Let's go through these. Um, first, it's a temporary escape, as you know. You know we've, we are living in the real world, and we want to get into this virtual world to do some, uh, have a fantasy about us, this environment. It's also social and anonymous at the same time. So you're socially interacting with people online, but you're also anonymous because you can be whoever, whatever, what, whenever you want, you know, and you have that anonymity. So you can be your real self. <clears throat> it's challenging and goal-oriented. So they put challenges in front of you, and you achieve that, you overcome that challenge, and you make it to your goal, and you save Princess Peach. <laughs> and the last thing, which is probably the most, the, the thing that's most applicable to us, is constant measurable growth. They're constantly getting data and feedback about how they're performing themselves versus others. They get statistics. There's all these things like the you know, like points, uh, uh, badges, all these little things accumulate into the constant measurable growth. So, anybody here watch uh, play Ready Player One? Yep. If, if you haven't, I would recommend you do that because uh, it really gives you a really great um, grounding into the world of gamers in a very entertaining Spielberg fashion. So. And I ended up here, sitting here in my tiny corner of nowhere. There's nowhere left to go. Nowhere. Except the Oasis. A whole virtual universe. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do. But they stay because of all the things they can be. Can you feel this? Yeah. It's the only place that feels like I mean anything. So you hear that? So, and these kids are using it to escape, to feel like they're somebody. And not all kids, I'm saying, but that's one of the net effects of it. And this future isn't too far from the truth. We have uh, augmented reality, we have VR, you know, and we're not very far from, uh, from synaptic uh, uh, interfaces. So. So, um, so just so know, you know, as I uh, pay very close attention to this world, I'm actually part of the AR VR club, is that this is a, 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 a going to be part of the future of education. There's a lot of developers out there that are building tools and software to, to take advantage of AR and VR, and then and, and also in, uh, apply to education. So these are coming probably five years down the road, but it's going to hit pretty soon here. So let's look at the, what well, we just went through, uh, but let's apply to my Maslow hierarchy of needs. So, first uh, thing is the sense of belonging. You know, you have social interactions. The social interactions brings that into the fold. Self-esteem, you know, by overcome, you get self-esteem by overcoming challenges. And then you get self-actualization. 
by contributing to a living world. These kids who are playing these online, they feel like they're part of something. They're part of something bigger. You know, they might not be getting at home or at school or some other, but they feel like they are getting it in the virtual world. That's it. Anybody need to take that picture? Okay. So, oh yeah, um, I have these attendance sheets passed out because I want to get your email address so I can send you the uh, um, stuff. So I'm gonna. Can I get some? Um, so it's read legibly. Actually, yeah, I'm going to do something else because I just thought of something. Okay, so this website that I just typed up there takes you to a Google form. Well, so then you can type it in. It'll be a lot easier. I just created that like uh, two hours ago. Because I thought, oh gosh, it's going to be I usually spend like three or four hours typing in these email addresses, and they usually half of them are wrong. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, the, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint file is so large that it, it blows up the, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm also going to include uh, media clips as well, so it's going to be get to a folder with stuff that, yeah, yes, oh, sorry. So it's KP, KP, KP. So just in case if you don't know, uh, KP, what KP stands for is knowledge and practice. So we put knowledge into practice, yay! Um, so that's just it, so go to that. Um, okay, cool, everyone got that? All right, so let's look at this. Video games are a multi-billion dollar industry. So, you know, before it was just like a niche thing, just like, you know, you, know, you got gamers who are just like, closet gamers who just like play like, like D&D &D people, anybody D&D? &D? Oh yeah, what's your fat go? Are serious too? I know, I know, we know. That was back when I was doing it. Okay, so what really brought video games to the forefront and into my reality, because I was startled by this, is this in, uh, in the Super Bowl 2015, um, you know when you watch, you watch Super Bowl, you watch for commercials, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, you don't watch it. <laughs> um, so when I was watching the, the, game, the commercials, uh, usually you expect the way you expect movie trailers, uh, babes and bikinis with beer, um, cars, lots of cars, uh, um, Budweiser dog, or, or horses, whatever. So you, you have these expectations, but then a game, a video game popped up in the commercial, and I was like, what? A video game? Advertising a game that I play in the Super Bowl? And this is a game called Clash of Clans, right? And it even featured a star. I don't know you, Big Buffy Boy 85. <laughs> if you think you can humiliate me and take my gold, think again. Oh, I am coming for you with lots of barbarians and dragons. <laughs> I can't wait to destroy your village while you beg for mercy. But you will get no mercy. I will have my revenge. Lion? A scum from Lion? Huh? <laughs> so, Liam, you will regret the day you crossed it. <laughs> Maybe seven fifty two. Funny thing is, a lot of celebrities do play this game. I, I know for a fact that Steve Mel does. Um, but anyway, um, I was like, whoa, a video game on football commercial thing that does not compute because. You know, I play this game, and how they how can they afford the million dollar ad time for for this silly little game that's free to play? Well, you know, it turns out that Clash of Clans actually does make some money. It earns five million five hundred seventy-three dollars something. So that yeah, they can afford to um, pay for a Super Bowl ad, especially when the statistics is put against this. A day, five and a half million dollars a day. Wow! Wow! Because people pay you microtransactions and they pay for upgrades and speed ups and things like that. So yeah, they're 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 diving into the basic need of I want to be better. Um, so that is just crazy. So you know, the video game industry is a ninety billion dollar industry. Just compare that to the movie industry, which you think is huge. It was only, it's only a forty one billion dollar industry. That's half the amount of video games. So, as you know, progress goes where the money goes. So, everyone is going into the video game industry. 
Movie studios are going into the video game industry. Everything is, is going to be going into that. And there are psychologists out there that are hired to, to basically tell the game companies how to make it even more addicting than it is. So video games are here to stay, and it'll be forever an addiction that we'll have to deal with. So, sorry. Um, so like when Fortnite came out, you know, we had colleges that announced that they're offering scholarships for Fortnite players. Whoa! You get, you get a scholarship for playing a video game? And in this article in the New York Times, it said, uh, in the one of the quotes, it's still built to be addictive. They do it with the intention of making it addictive. You know, so imagine like, you know, uh, a, a pharmaceutical company say, hey, I made this uh, drug and I designed it to be addicted, must God. Um, I'm not saying Oxycontin decided to do that, but, <laughs> um, but yeah. So, but they, they blatantly advertise that they want it to be addicting. So anybody here heard of eSports? Okay, a good number of you. Now, has anybody here um, um, tuned on the TV and actually saw a video game playing on TV? And you're like, well, why are you watching people playing video games? And you got people announcing the, the game stats, just like a regular sports game, right? So eSports is becoming hugely popular. In fact, you know, they're turning garages and store malls into eSports arenas. So they're repurposing these old buildings that, you know, like, you know, Skating rinks. Who goes to that anymore? Let's build a uh, a uh, esports arena. In fact, they're they're thinking about uh, putting esports in the Paris Olympics in uh, 2024 as an actual sport. Is that wow? Yeah, total wow. <laughs> you know, in fact, like you know, this is like uh, a, a clip of, uh, of of Overwatch, which is a game I play, and they have these leagues. Atlanta fans and the rain so you all the people in the stage are in the arena, and we got these sports players. This is your Overwatch League minute. Eight teams converged on a like, like, like 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 second James or like Michael Jordan or Tom Green won both their matches, delighting the crowd and breathing new life into their season playoffs prospects. This happened like three days ago, I think. Back in Los Angeles, the eight team stage three playoffs bracket is officially set. <laughs> and on money, Thursday, they're betting money on this too. Dante and the Outlaws take on Twilight and the Titans at 6 p.m. Pacific. That match will be followed by a clash between Tiam and the Dragons and Mono. Oh, and the Dragons, Excelsior. they're a formidable group. On Friday, Arden <laughs> Dynasty I think they have your links. at 6 p.m. Pacific. And directly after that match, Kareem and the Bellion take yeah, on the Dragons. That guy was a badass. <laughs> <laughs> Look at those classics. <laughs> <laughs> this has been your Overwatch. But minute. seriously, this is mainstream now. It's not like the closet gamer that was like, you know, playing on front of a Nintendo. Uh, entertains the cinema on your like old eight inch tube. It's like there's like people making money. In fact, anybody here heard of Ninja? Okay, you're not so you, yeah, you're not in the gaming world if you don't know about Ninja. So Ninja is one of the most popular uh, game uh, uh, Twitchers on the internet. Now Twitch is this, like YouTube but for gamers. So he's a streamer. He has four over four million subs, which means subscribers. That means four million people subscribe to his channel and actually get alerts and watch his stuff. So it's like subscribing to Amazon or Hulu or, 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 uh, Netflix, or Netflix, but free, of course. So he makes $700,000 from his subscribers. But you know, he does that every month. Oh, okay. so oh yeah, that's like, huh? Yeah. This is the person, not a game. Person. His name is Ninja. Yeah. And that doesn't count endorsements, which totaled to me about $10 million in 2018. So this is the guy. Yeah. Who's behind us? And all he does is sit in front of his computer and play video games and run and have a running commentary. Whoops, did I do that? Yeah. So it's just incredible. I mean, so kids are looking at these people and they're their role models. They want to be, if you go into class and say, hey, everybody watch Ninja, every kid's going to be like, oh my gosh, you know, you know Ninja? I mean, heck, you know, when I go into schools, they say, are you Ninja? Because I don't know why you're Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I, I do tell them I play Fortnite, so they're like, oh, got to be someone cool. And anyway, so, and so when I look at that, I, I see of this. Oh, you can't hear it. You know, the Keanu Reeves blow. <laughs> anyway, so what I'm here to do is to entertain you, but also to get, provide you some really solid information and to build you empathy. So I believe that empathy is one of the most powerful tools as an educator that you can have. So that you can look at the students that are, uh, you're dealing with in the elementary school as they're growing up, looking up to these idols now like Ninja, 
to um, middle school, to high school and college, where they're all active gamers. They all have these social networks. They're either playing Fortnite, or they could be playing Madden, or they could be playing Forza. These are, you know, they're all different kinds of games, but you've probably never heard of them before. And the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oops, what did I just do? I did that. Okay. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. <laughs> No joke. <laughs> oh, I, I love it. And yeah, true. It only is half the battle. So because like what I like, what I'm doing to do is I'm going to equip you with some really great bits of knowledge about how you can think about these children now, and and really figure out ways to take their <coughs> pedagogy and modify and mold it into their world. So I want you to witness the power of gamification. Um, when when we were experimenting with. Uh, a group of kids, uh, one of our big challenges was how can you get a, 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 a class that's highly at risk that does not like math. So we went to a, a school um, in South Phoenix and we, had, we had, were working with kids who could not answer this, what is 5 plus 4? And the answer is 9. nine. But they had to count the figures. <laughs> so, so by applying gamification, we were able to get kids in the classroom to do something like this. So, so we first present a challenge. You know, your challenge is answer as many questions as you can in one minute. <laughs> okay? So they got that challenge. And then they, and then they tell them, okay, you know, uh, as you continue to do that, you're going to earn badges and score points. Okay? So, that, so those are the rewards. And then because of that, um, they start answering math problems. And this is a kid, so they get these red, green squares which tell them, hey, I got it right. And then, they are challenged by the fact that the x is moving on both sides of the equation, so it's not a single four x. So it really gets them to think about the problem. And as you can see, he's not a little fast, right? So when we put this into the into the lab environment and we saw these results, we're like, "What the heck just happened here?" <laughs> these kids who didn't have a lick of math or even cared about math are all of a sudden engaged because they want to do this. They want to perform, they want to achieve, they want to uh, be the very best in Pokemon. <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. So that's okay. 60 that's and zero wrong. So you got 60. That's so the math that counts count to be 60, 60 seconds, that's one per, <laughs> yeah, second. So <laughs> that's just incredible. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a little clip of him. Like this is two months later. I'm just going to jump ahead. Um, Actually, let me zoom in here. Oops. Uh, let's try this again. You like? So now he's doing uh, four term mixed addition, subtraction. A little more complicated. Um, there's words being mixed in, so then you know, increasing in challenge, and so on and so forth. You know, and you know, four months, and then here he is. Uh, check this out. Okay, go. My name is Ryan, I'm the fourth generation, I have 209,000 points and 17,353 questions. He okay. knows his stats. <laughs> he wants to keep increasing it. And here he is doing like, oops, dang it, did it again. Play, there we go. Okay, go. Okay, My name is Ryan, I'm the fourth generation. Okay, so now he's doing like these comprehension questions. Pretty fast, right? It just keeps getting better and better and better. And they're going to keep leveling up, moving on tiers, getting badges. Now, who here thinks this is phenomenal? Raise your hand. That's the power of gamification. So, let's go. Okay, moving on. All right, so by, by, by sheer fact we gamified it, we got these kids to answer anywhere between, you know, at minimum two, three hundred, and at maximum a thousand a day because they kept wanting to do it. They became addicted to it. You know, we, we put this in the classroom, we have kids go home and actually spend an hour answering math problems. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> kids want to go home and answer math problems. Whoa, this is a twilight zone. Um, so that's the reality we're facing. In fact, look at this. Yeah. So do you, guys, do you guys want to go home? No! <laughs> you want to keep playing? Yeah! I, I never, I never played math, but they made it to a <laughs> Yeah. What about that? Did you see there that looked like a video game? What, what about it? 
What about it? Did, it? did it have guns? Did it have talking animals? Did it have like the, the things that you would see in a Hallmark video game? That control. Competition. Yes, the control, it is. Yes. So do you guys do you, so so projected in front of the classroom we have this, which is a key indicator. You know, we have this goal that moves across the screen as the kids are engaged. So this goal prevents pre pre presents to them a real-time feedback. They're like, oh look, we're moving, making progress. Our goal here is 20,000 points. So, so we, we give them a goal that's achievable. You now we also create races between other classes. And then they're saying, oh hey, we got some competition. We have stats, you know, how many points the classes earned, how many, how many cumulative math hours, 144 so far in this particular instance. And then we have badges and we have an epic goal. And when we hit 1.75 million points, we're gonna have an ice cream party, yay. <laughs> and the kids go home, I wanna get the ice cream party faster, I'm gonna spend an hour doing math problems. Anybody here have kids who do that? <laughs> if you do, please talk to me. And in front, we also include a leaderboard, a big no-no in education. But if you use leaderboards correctly, it can create positive interdependence. It can uplift the kids. In fact, each, the, the, the fact that these goals are set at the table for each student, each student's working on their own level, and we have SPEND students down here who have easier goals, but they're still making the goal. But also we have indicators to teachers say, hey, I need to go help these two students because they're stumbling and they need extra help because this is a timeline and everyone should be moving at the same pace and they're slowing down, and why is that? Well, they hit something that's, that's getting them trouble. So then the teacher can intervene and do stuff uh, with the students. So all these things combined together create this really incredible environment that gets these kids to accelerate well beyond their potential. In fact, we're learning new things that have never been discovered before. Because if a kid does a thousand math problems a day, new things are going to happen to their brain that no one else has ever made happen. Like we have kids who are learning math problems without any instruction. They're figuring it out on their own. Hey, I play a video game. Do I get instruction on that? No, I figure it out on my own. So they're creating their own personal algorithms to solve the next level problem. And they on and on and on. Self-discovery, the most important way to learn. So. Moving on, we are catering to the accelerated mind. In, in schools, everyone's told you have to go at a certain pace because we need to do this because this measurement is what we clock it to be. Oh my gosh, you lost me, that's too slow. But the, the, the way the accelerated mind is, well, I wanna go through it fast, but then I wanna go through it fast again. Every single iteration through it, we go through, we get a little bit more, and then through, through, through that, they create the bigger picture. The minds are so accelerated that we need to throw information at them at a rapid pace, and then we need to keep repeating that process. So it's not one pass, two pass, three passes, it can be five passes to go through. In fact, try to keep up with this. This is a game uh, playing a, a, a player called Blink. So this player blinks, so try to keep up with this. This is a pro gamer. Okay, so you have to shoot these people, Tons of feedback. Kills. How their health is. Their special powers. The team stats. Their teammates and how they're doing. All at the same time and they're able to compute all that and absorb all that and react to it and make decisions from that. Is this a superhuman? No, it's just a regular kid. It's probably a 12 year old. <laughs> it's insane. Look at that, so tosses the bomb, blows up two people, goes over, shoots this guy in the back, reloads, hits again, goes over, hits the club or someone in the face, shoots someone flying over their head. Okay? And then all of a sudden they jump down and, okay. I can't even keep up with that. And I'm pretty good. So, you know, for, for students, this is the most important thing. But honestly, like once you get in there and you just get going, you completely forget that you're even doing math. It's honestly just really fun. And the whole class looks forward to it every day. We beg our teacher, we're like, oh, let us do it. Like Math, the escape from reality. Whoa. And, you know, and for us, you know, this is one of the most critical things. This teacher worked with kids who failed uh, four classes and, and algebra.
and fall, right? So how much have you seen as far as your skill, skill growth through the past uh, couple months? Oh my gosh, they've grown so much. They used to not be able to do negative three plus two, and now they're solving equations, finding the differences between percents, decimals, rational numbers, and a whole lot of things that have just started with just adding numbers. Yeah, foundation skills. I mean, so this uh, this math thing that we did, we used science, science to make it happen. And there's nine science principles that are in it. And we're going to be going deep into that science tomorrow morning at 7, 5, 15 in the morning. So if anyone of you are awake in the morning, uh, come and check it out. It's really fascinating. You're going to learn so much about brain science that your brain is going to explode. So, um, so first we need to understand the language. So I'm going to go through some of the things that mechanics that kids are very familiar with. So the first one is grinding. So anybody who's not a gamer, guess what grinding means. Anybody raise your hand. Just take a stab at the... Working hard. Working hard? Okay, good. Anybody else? No one else wants to take a stab at what? Persistence. Oh, persistence. Good. Okay, so you guys are getting a good picture. When I first presented this, people were thinking, oh, that's a bad dance move. Don't, 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 don't. Or, you know, you pop the ollie and do a grind. You know, you skate or skate. All right. So the grinding is a mechanic in, game, in gaming industry that's purposely done to do this. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you like, the game that I used to play, thankfully not anymore, where, where basically um, I would do uh, this task. So I would be sitting on a lake and hitting the fishing foot. And I would be fishing and fishing and fishing for like, let's say 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, I caught a fish. <laughs> level two, woo! Then I keep fishing again 20 minutes later, level three, yay! And I keep doing that for four hours until I get to level 10. Once I get to level 10, I'm like, okay, wow, that was so much fun spending five hours fishing, hitting that button. Then I go to the, the, to the, uh, the fish monitor and I, and I pick up the, the, the rainbow rod. And with the rainbow rod, I go back to the fishing spot and spend another 20 hours fishing so I can catch the rainbow trout. Well, once I got the rainbow trout, I take it to the weaponsmith, which turns that trout into this magical rainbow sword, which then I could go into the rainbow dungeon and then kill the rainbow dragon, which takes me another five weeks. But all that started with fishing. Was that fun? Hell no. <laughs> that was not fun. But the end result was gratifying. So grinding is a mechanic in the game where they basically get kids to, to do this uh, menial task to either get coins, XP, rewards, or, or various things. And usually it's something very, very stupid. Same with farming. Farming is basically taking multiple grinding elements. So I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, and I just repeat those steps over and over again. So I'm grinding through multiple steps, okay? That's called farming. So if you hear a kid say, hey, oh, he actually he uses vernacular, say, hey, you gotta grind out that lesson. They're like, oh yeah, I guess I gotta do that. You know, or they're like, hey, we gotta farm out that project. You know, hey, we, we gotta farm it. So they, they understand what farming is. You know, so that's what those things mean. Speed run, you know? So speed run is a very interesting phenomenon. So I play, let's say, uh, um, Super Mario, um, and I play World 3-6, and I beat it in 3 minutes and 78 seconds. Oh, not 78 seconds, that's not possible. Uh, 3 minutes and 17 seconds, sorry. My mind's moving faster than my mouth. <laughs> and then uh, I, I go to uh, Facebook or, or uh, Instagram, and I say, hey, I just beat this level in 3 minutes and 17 seconds, and all of a sudden, comment. Oh, yeah, I did it in 3 minutes and 12 seconds. I'm like, whoa, how'd you do that? And then we start this discourse, and, you t and and things like that. I go back to the game, I start playing again, I spend five hours, and I shave off a millisecond every single time. So speedrunning is the is the uh, is basically trying to outdo yourself and also outdo one another. So and people play these games to, to speedrun it to try to perfect the level so that they can get through it fastest. You know. Raids. Raids are really interesting, you know. If you do any type of online role play game, you usually go you could uh, do raids. So what a raid is, especially popularized by World of Warcraft, is basically you have like, like let's say, you have five, five people who are playing the game. Each person has a different class. You got wizard, warrior, um, a cleric, um, 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 an elf, and, and a smurf. <coughs> and then basically each person has a role. They say, okay, we're going to meet together at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They don't even have to be in the same town. They don't even have to be in the same country. But they coordinate a time. 
and they each also had a task to do before they got together. So one person had to collect a, 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 a map, another person had to collect this uh, potion, so on and so forth. So that when they get these components, these prerequisites, they could go all together into a high level dungeon so that they can work their way through it. But they can't go alone, they have to work together. So each person has a specialization that, that gets them through this dungeon. And when they get to the end, they defeat the boss, they get this magical reward, and then they repeat that process over again. That's what a raid is. So when they, when they have a kid say, hey, I'm going on a raid at 7 p.m., they're like, oh yeah, have fun. There's a lot of pre-planning and execution that has to happen for them to be successful. <coughs> because you don't want to die because you'll lose your stuff in some cases. So you have they take it very seriously. And the last one, which is a very interesting phenomenon, which is what I call a 100 percenter or a completionist. Anybody here a completionist? Oh, I feel sorry for you. I'm a, I'm a 73 percenter, so <laughs> I'm like, I'm 73, I'm like, that. I'm done. But what a, what a completionist is, is that in the video game, there are lots of things to do. So uh, I'll use Grand Theft Auto as my example. So I play Grand Theft Auto, and I make it through the game, and it says, you finished the game. You completed 58%. I'm like, wait, I just finished the game. Well, you didn't do all these different achievements, you didn't collect these collectibles, you go and do these side quests, so there's all these little answering things that I need to do to become a completionist. And, and I have to tell you this, probably one out of five of your kids are completionists. Because this is being ingrained in our head that we have to have it all. So, they're obsessed with it. Like, you know, for those of you who are, you get that itch, you're like, oh gosh, I gotta keep doing it, right? Right, right? Yeah, that's 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 Huh? Gotta get that platinum pro. Can I get that platinum pro? Yeah. And, and it's, it's an obsession. And it's becoming more and more prevalent. So let's take a look at grinding, for example. Grinding is equal to remediation. Remediation is doing, you know, what we do, what the computing world is doing is we're getting them used to doing meaningless tasks over again for, for minor rewards. So they're going to see little incremental growth. We're going to get little rewards here and there. So we can all use this as a way to introduce and, and task them into remediation elements. And we also specify a goal. You know, we could give them a special item and ability. So, so grinding can be equated to remediation. You know, we're getting them to keep doing these like things that are, seem meaningless, but eventually will get them to this ultimate goal. Okay, and we got it. Um, and also, you know, I want to clarify that gamifying education is not creating a video game. I get a lot of people say, oh, we have to create, uh, well, remember Second Life? Oh, boy, that was a terrible idea. Um, but yeah, video games should not exist in education because all it does is serve as a distraction. Um, yeah, like, you know, there's a lot of games out there that, like, you know, kids who are going on a quest and doing, yeah, that's good, but then they spend lots of time doing other things without actually engaging in the work. No, it, it is a good character angle, and, but it's a very fine line to, to try. Um, so let's look at five steps to communication. So first you need to know the audience, define a clear learning objective, and the why. And the why is the most important because everyone, so it, you know, bringing relevance to your, your subject matter. Structure the experience with the goal in mind. Identify the resources you need, so what they need to collect to be able to make that uh, goal. And then apply the gamification process that's fluid and, in, and intuitive and integrating choice. You know, so if you can bring choice into the mix, that makes a very good difference. So, you know, it, and the thing is, it, it's not easy, you know, because we're so used to one path to the end. But really, we know life isn't one path to the end. There's multiple ways to approach it. Um, in fact, I think it was the, was it the keynote that spoke about the, the path, I'm trying to recall. If, he's, if it was him or someone else, I'd listen to. Um, but it's very true. No. So, the, so those are some of the uh, ideas. Um, but there's also understanding game preferences. This is very important. Yeah. So there's games out there, and each one tailors to a, a different personality type. So as we know, the most popular one is first-person shooter. It also gets the most press too, because you know we're talking about you know Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Overwatch, all these shooter games. Like you know. We always equate that with guns and violence, right? You know, you play these games, you're gonna go out and shoot someone. Well, you know, um, we say we tend to think that these kids are aggressive, violent, bullies, they hate vindictive, which could be true of the trait. But then let's look at the other side of the coin and look at it. Now, these kids who play these games are perceptive, they're team players, they have super fast reactions and they're very adaptive. 
Like there's games where like the game environment changes constantly and you have to adapt to it. And they have to be able to do that. So these are the skills that they're acquiring as they're playing the game. Just like that video I just showed you of Overwatch. Do you, would you say that kid had, uh, is perceptive? Because he's made a paid player, reactive, and very adaptive at the same time? Yeah. So that's first person shooter. Now let's look at another one that's very popular. MMORPG, anybody? I know you, some of you know, but it stands for multi, Massively multi, Multiplayer Online Role Play Game. Popularized by World of Warcraft, Dota 2, uh, Star Wars o, Old Republic, and even my favorite, EVE Online, which is an economic space simulator. Ooh, fun. <laughs> um, but, you know, so but these kids, like, you know, you think, like, they're, they're reclusive, they're passive, they're antisocial because they're sitting in front of the computer all the time staring at a screen. But they're actually really big team players. They have a solid understanding of economics because in the game, there's currency and there's value to everything. And the value fluctuates based on supply and demand. So if they get the sword, and they understand that the, 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 the sword is worth more in this other uh, land, they'll travel there and sell it there. So there's economics in there. And it's the goal oriented, so I have to decide what class I want to do and, then, uh, and make a goal for that class. So I want to be, not class as in school, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't remember class as in, um, as in type of player, like warrior, wizard, things like that. And, and you have to make these choices to decide, okay, I want to be a warrior wizard, so I have to make these choices in my, um, in my career path to, that, to become that. <clears throat> they have the digitally social, they have the solid decision makers, and a planner. So there are other genres, which I'm not going to get into, but it's going to be in the PowerPoint. But as, uh, anybody going to the uh, deep dive session on Saturday? Okay, well, in just in case of, uh, if you do, it's going to be this expanded to two hours. <laughs> because I actually honestly have enough content to spend three hours uh, on this. But, but, um, but that's just a little glimpse as to the world of, um, of the game like the world that the kids are living in. So this is, I'm putting this up right now, but I'm gonna have two more slides I'm gonna show you, uh, which are, are really good tools that you can use to uh, relate to your kids. So, um, okay, oops, I need to get through these. Uh, time waster, yay, okay. and my Okay, I meant to go to that thing. All right, so here's my other experience of gaming, which is a really cool um, site. So if you go to the site, gametree.me, uh, you know Myers Briggs, right? So on it uh, has the same similar fashion but related to video games. So I am a INTJ in real life, and actually I'm an INTJ in video games, go figure. So <laughs> engineering mastermind, <laughs> um, so, so, So those tell you a little bit about, you know, they'll list like what kind of games they are and what, the, what they like to play. And basically by knowing the games they like and, and, and they want to play, that kind of gives you a little glimpse into their mind, just like the Myer, Myers-Briggs does for personality traits. So it's a similar type of thing. Uh, so it's a really great uh, asset to kind of like to uh, have your kids do as an exercise. Uh, and then there's another site called ContentFoundry.com. So this is actually a survey site that you should all take just for the fun of it and then maybe have your kids to go through it. But what it does is it asks a bunch of questions about games that you play, games that you do, and certain other social activities, and it builds this profile for you. So apparently I am really heavy into action, emerging games, not very creative, you know, creative being like, you know, games that you build stuff, not, not that I'm not creative. Um, I like social, I like games that include social, a somewhat mastery, so like, like I said, I'm a 73 percenter, so this is saying, a, you know, my mastery is, is 69, so that means that to me, to, to a teacher, I can say, you can say I can get, I'll, I'll get to a certain point, but I don't, I don't need to make it all the way to platinum <laughs> um, to be satisfied. <laughs> And then, you know, I, I like achievements. I like earning those badges. I like getting those rewards. I like getting those little, little stars and trinkets and things like that. Uh, so remember, gamification, it also can be stars. Kids love stickers. <laughs> you know, one of the things that's most, most amazing to me is like they still love stickers. And they those use those stickers to create that wonderful sense of, uh, of belonging. So. Oh, back to this slide again. So I have a, couple, a few minutes for questions. I'm glad I was able to complete all of the slides, all 72 of them within an hour. So did y'all have fun? Yeah. yeah, awesome. Do I have any questions? Any questions? Yes, you. MMORPG. What does that say? MMORPG, Massively Multiplayer Online Role Play Game. <laughs> Just Google it. <laughs>
before they deployed to uh, Romania last year. So. Thank you. 